Okay, good morning everyone, uh, and uh, welcome back as always. Uh, and I don't know who brought this cushion, it was very kind of you to bring a cushion for me. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, it's quite nice and tall, which is what I like when I sit, so that's kind of really, really handy. So thank you for your kindness and compassion. And uh, now uh, let us uh, carry on with the, uh, the suttas. Uh, and uh, we have actually gone into the Anapanasati Sutta in quite a bit of detail, so I hope you have enjoyed that. This is kind of the main idea behind this retreat, uh, uh, breath to breath to awakening. Uh, so I think it's kind of nice to do this in a lot of detail. We spent almost two full days of just looking at that. Uh, and the rest of the things we can, we have to, we have no choice, we have to go a bit faster, uh, otherwise we're not going to get uh, very far during this retreat. Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know about you, but I find this whole idea of uh, mindfulness of breathing and where it leads and the kind of qualities of mind that we can develop extraordinarily inspiring. Uh, and you may not be there yet, but you may have a little bit of taste of what these things can bring. Uh, and just this idea that these things are available in the world, that there is such a thing uh, as deep samadhi, that there is kind of almost unimaginable amounts of bliss and peace available on this path. But just the idea, even if you have just a little bit of a taste of it, uh, is kind of extraordinarily inspiring. Yeah. There's something about this path that is very, uh, once you get the feel from it, uh, it kind of draws you in uh, and you don't want to do anything else in your life. You understand that everything else is kind of pales by comparison to this. Uh, everything kind of gets seen. Uh, as uh, far less significant uh, than what you can do in your spiritual practice. Uh, now what is interesting about this uh, Anapanasati Sutta is that this kind of idea, this sort of structure uh, where things, uh, a lot of bliss is mentioned, the peace is mentioned, uh, and it happens in a particular sequence, uh, this kind of sequence, this kind of structure uh, is found in so many places in the suttas. Uh, it is not just in Anapanasati, uh, the seven factors of awakening uh, are very similar in the way they are structured. I think I mentioned this before. Uh, the sequence is largely the same. Uh, the kind of mental qualities that are mentioned are also found there. Uh, and the seven factors of awakening are a very core aspect of the Dhamma. It is part of the 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas, the 37 aids to awakening. Uh, which the Buddha said uh, quite specifically, this is what my teaching is about, uh, it's part of that. So it's absolutely fundamental to these teachings. Uh. Then you have what is known as the dependent liberation sequence, right? Uh, sometimes called transcendental dependent origination. Uh, and this is dependent origination uh, of uh, how liberation comes about, yeah? dependent liberation. Uh. The ordinary dependent origination is how suffering comes about, uh, yeah? how we are trapped in this samsaric existence that's going around and around. That is kind of what de dependent liberation shows us. Uh, in other words, the causes for suffering, why there is suffering. Dependent liberation shows us uh, the dependent arising of the escape from samsara, the escape from suffering, liberation itself. Uh, so again, a very important aspect of the Dhamma, and we, you can say it is important because it occurs in many different places, in various variations, uh, and sometimes the full 12 length, 12 factors, sometimes in, or 10 factors, uh, 11 depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, sometimes in fewer factors, uh, but it's found spread out through the suttas. Uh, and uh, so, again, the structure is very similar to what you see in the Anapanasati Sutta. Same <laughs> terminology found again and again. Uh, the same kind of sequence uh, uh, arises again and again in this, uh, in this particular sequence. Uh, and then there is another uh, sequence that we have a look at uh, later on, which is kind of a derived version of dependent liberation. Uh, uh, but this is where we talk about the recollections. Yeah, I mentioned the recollections already, the Buddha Nusati, Dhamma Nusati, uh, Sila Nusati, yeah, the recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the, our virtuous conduct. Uh, and that too, that sequence too, is very similar to these things. Uh, so this idea is very broadly found in the Sutta. Yeah? So when we look at the Anapanasati Sutta, this is really the kind of main 
to use a fancy word, a main kind of paradigm yeah, for how meditation <laughs> is to be experienced uh, from a first-person point of view. Uh, this is kind of the, the, the way, uh, and, uh, which is very nice, right? Because it's all about happiness, all about these incredibly positive states of mind. Uh, and uh, so again, it comes back to this idea that Buddhism isn't pessimistic at all. If you know what you're talking about, actually it's very optimistic. Yeah. But you have to kind of see the problem, see the issue, yeah. and then you move to the solution, yeah. and then you get there. Yeah. The reason, again, why Buddhism can seem pessimistic is because we often see things from the Buddha's point of view. Yeah. And when you see things from the Buddha's point of view, yeah. then things may look a bit different, but we can't really relate to that. Yeah. So sometimes it's silly for us always to look at Buddhism from the Buddha's point of view. Sometimes we have to look at these teachings from a more ordinary point of view. How do we relate to them? And when you look at it from an ordinary point of view, actually what you see is happiness, peace, all these very positive qualities. The Buddha, because he has a very profound insight, then things will look a bit different. So we should be careful with trying to kind of get the Buddha view when we're not ready for the Buddha view yet. So um, then, of course, the uh, issue is, well, if all of these things are there, if this is what Anapanasati is supposed to do, how come everyone here isn't completely blissed out already? Huh? How come you're not sitting all night, yeah, just in pure bliss all the time? Huh? What's going on? The Buddha says it's supposed to happen. Huh? It's not happening to me? Okay, explain yourself, right? What is, <laughs> what's the story here? Huh? And of course the answer with all of these kind of conditional sequences uh, is that uh, the answer is always in the beginning of these sequences. Because uh, if everything is supposed to happen naturally, uh, yeah, according to the laws of nature, uh, and everything happens just by itself, without any effort or any intention on our part, uh, then it must be the beginning of the sequence that is important. Uh. So what we're going to do now, we're going to inquire into the causes, uh, yeah, why things are not happening, and how we can make this sequence come about. Uh. So we're kind of starting at, we'll start at the highest point, uh, and now we're going to go backwards. Uh. So I apologize for that, and uh, now we're going to go into the more mundane, ordinary things. Uh. We've seen all the inspiring stuff, uh. now we're going to get into the kind of stuff, the hard, the hard work of the, of the path. Uh. So I hope you will forgive me for kind of doing things in slightly reverse order. I thought it was nice to start out with the inspiring things, uh, and then kind of uh, having established that, uh, then we can look at what it is that we have to do now. So uh, this is what we're going to do now, and then at the end of the retreat I will come back to the idea of meditation again, and look at Anapanasati, how the meditation progress happens, uh, but through a slightly different uh, angle, so as to broaden our scope and understanding of what's, uh, what this is all about. So, uh, yeah, so I hope you approve of the way I'm teaching. If you don't approve, I'm still going to teach the same way, so I just, uh, <laughs> what can I say? Okay, so the, um, uh, the next sutta is called a monk, a bhikkhu sutta. It is from the uh, Satipatthana Samyutta. I will I like to talk about where the suttas are from every time, so you get a familiarity with the, the suttas and how they are structured. Yeah. So you will see here it says SN 47.3, yeah. and SN stands for uh, Sanyutta Nikaya, and Sanyutta Nikaya is translated into English as the connected discourses of the Buddha, it's kind of the usual translation. Yeah. Uh, Venerable Sujato had the linked discourses, uh, and connected and linked basically means the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, connect. This is the forty-seventh chapter. So there's fifty-six chapters altogether in the connected discourses. Uh, this is the forty-seventh, uh, and it's called the Satipatthana Sanyutta, the connected discourses on Satipatthana practice. Yeah. So. Um, uh, so these are all meditation suttas, it's about meditation, how to apply our mind, etc. <coughs> and this is the third sutta in the Satipatthana Samyutta, out of a total of around 60 or something like that, 55, I can't remember, something, <coughs> something like that. Yeah. And so, uh, here we are going to look more at the causes, uh, the foundations for meditation practice. Uh, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, 
but uh, just and then just to kind of establish a few basic ideas, uh, and then we will move on to discuss this in more detail. Uh, so uh, uh, I will just uh, read this out, so you can just listen and uh, relax. And uh, so uh, uh, this is a full sutta. Actually, usually I use extracts, but this is a full sutta, which is kind of nice. Uh, at one time, the Buddha. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jaita's Grove, another Pindika's monastery there. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. When I've heard it, I'll live alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen, and resolute. This is exactly how some foolish people ask me for something. But when the teaching has been explained, they think only of following me around. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, Sir, may the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. May the Holy One teach me the Dhamma in brief. Hopefully I can understand the meaning of what the Buddha says. Hopefully I can be an heir to the Buddha's teachings. So let's just stop there because it gets too much if we read too far. Let's just uh, stop there for a minute. So here we have the Buddha staying in Savati, Chaitas Grove, the main monastery of the Buddha in those days. And if you go to India, you can still go to Savati and you can still see another Pindika's monastery, which is kind of cool. Yeah, It connects you to these ancient teachings in a very real way when you see these places. And Savati, there's not much left of Savati. <laughs> The city, uh, or the town, I should say, uh, except for the embankments around the city, they can still be seen. Uh, like these big mounds of earth uh, that were used as uh, embankments, and maybe there was a wall on top of those things. Uh, apart from that, there's nothing at all left of that city. Uh, it's just a kind of a grassland or, or something to that effect. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that in those days, uh, it seems that all buildings were made out of wood. There was no stone, was not really used, bricks were not used yet. Uh, occasionally bricks were used, but very, very rarely. Uh, and so it was very perishable. Uh, and uh, the cities basically just disappeared. Uh, yeah, and all that is left are these big mounds of clay that kind of show the boundaries and the borders of the city. Uh. Anyway, I would really recommend people, if you are keen Buddhist uh, and you have a chance to go to India and you find someone inspiring to lead a tour, go for it. It's actually very interesting. Yeah? And it opens up. It, instead of the suttas looking like fairy tales, uh, yeah, and looking like something, yeah, is it real, is it not real? You kind of, sometimes you wonder, it sounds like it's a bit like stories, these suttas. Uh, but when you go to India and you see some of these places and you see it is exactly as it is described in the suttas, uh, it makes a connection for you. Uh, and you realize that these are real historical documents. Uh, yeah, they're not kind of some idea in someone's head. Uh, actually, uh, these things exist. Uh, and that kind of makes these things come alive. It, one of the most important and difficult things with the suttas and the word of the Buddha is to really make it come alive. Uh, really feel that you are in the presence of the Buddha. He's teaching you. He is your teacher. And the more things like going to these holy places in India, seeing what is there, it makes this happen for you. And uh, so please take the opportunity if it comes up. Uh, if you, you know, uh, India can be a bit um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it can be a bit arduous. It can be, it is, I, I, can, I think many people have a kind of love-hate relationship with India. Uh, because uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a country that is very different from uh, our European kind of way of doing things. Uh, uh, but uh, it is worth it. Uh, a little bit of hardship to go through that sort of inspiration. It really is worth it. Uh, anyway, I will talk more about this later on because it is very, I think, an important part of uh, uh, Buddhism. So then he, this mendicant goes up to the Buddha. Uh, and he asks for a teaching in brief. And this is a very common thing in the suttas, uh, because you take that teaching with you. It is as if you get a special teaching from the Buddha. That is your teaching. Yeah, yeah. You have heard it. Uh, how special is it? Actually, it's not that special at all. Uh, when you look at what he teaches people in brief, it is just usually the standard kind of teachings. Uh, but it is 
tailored to that person. Uh, so sometimes we think that um, the Buddha was a master at tailoring the teachings to individuals, uh, and that there would be special teachings for the individuals. Uh, but actually, all he does, he takes from his large repertoire of teachings, uh, and he takes one teaching from that repertoire and then, then gives that to you. So there's nothing really all that special about it. Uh, it's not as if he singles you out for special treatment. Uh, no, uh, you kind of, you're just one of the bunch. And again, this comes back to this idea that we are all basically the same. Uh, so teachings that are generally applicable to people, they are also applicable to individuals. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe you have a bit more problem with uh, desire, so he gives you a teaching how to overcome desire. Maybe you are doing really well with your samadhi, so he gives you a teaching on samadhi. But they are part of the overall teachings. Uh, the Buddha doesn't really give anything special to you. Uh, sometimes people think, yeah, if I get to see Buddha Maitreya, he will give me a special teaching, then I'll make really fast progress, yeah, and then everything will be fine. Uh, actually, probably not. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So that is how things tend to be here. Yeah. yeah, and then he says, when I've heard it, uh, I will live alone, withdrawn. Yeah, the idea of seclusion again, alone here, what is it? Ekata maybe, or eka? Withdrawn, diligent, well, the word diligent is uh, apamada, which really means, doesn't really mean diligent. Uh, diligent sounds like you're working really hard, yeah? You're kind of diligent doing your work. Yeah. It means more like heedful. Heedful is a very precise word, I think, in this context. Uh, Maybe not such a common word, uh, but uh, again, if you translate for people who have English as a second language, it may not, perhaps not be the best word, but it's actually very precise. You're heedful. In other words, you're careful. You're circumspect. Uh, yeah, you really uh, uh, you, you think about things before you do things. Uh, you even think before you think. Uh, yeah, you're careful about things. Uh. Keen is quite a good translation. Atapi. This idea of uh, having an interest in things, being inspired in things, and then applying yourself as a consequence. Keen. And resolute is okay, but I would translate the last one as diligent, actually. So you get something like heedful, keen, and diligent uh, would be my preferred translation. But again, uh, there is no translation which is always right, so all of this will be fine uh. And then you can see the Buddha is not entirely pleased with this monk. Yeah? That is exactly how some foolish people ask me for something. Yeah? He's kind of giving a bit of a hint there. Um, and then you just, once they've heard the teaching, just, just think of following me around. And uh, you can see how this is, seems to be a common thread in spiritual circles. Uh, this idea of being attached to a guru or attached to a teacher uh, and following that teacher around and sitting in that teacher's presence at all times. Uh, and uh, you can see why people do that, because some people have a very powerful presence. I have met some monks and people, when you are with them, it's like you feel you're bathed in this aura of peace and kindness. Uh, and of course it feels nice. Uh, and one of those people is uh, you know, one of my favorite monks, Ajahn Ganha who I have been seen a few times, and he has this incredible kindness about him. You feel like you are in the presence of something very beautiful when you are there. And you can just kind of hang out with Ajahn Ganha all day and kind of just relax and be at ease. He will never judge you. He will always have metta for you regardless of what you do. Actually, Ajahn Brahm is also a bit like that. Yeah, you, you can be a bit of a scallywag. You can say the wrong thing. You can argue with him. And he never, it never takes any offense at anything. Yes. Next day, he's always exactly the same towards you, regardless of what you have said or done. Uh, no judgment. It's very beautiful to be in the presence of someone who never judges you, uh, but they accept you for who you are. Uh, and this is kind of what, uh, uh, what happens with, uh, uh, with these people. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so following someone around uh, yeah, and just being with them, that's not really what the Dhamma is about. Uh, so we have to learn that sense of independence as well. Uh, of course it is useful to be with teachers. Of course it is useful to kind of have the teachings come into us through osmosis, yeah? penetrating, just being in the presence. Uh, and I find it very useful to hang around Ajahn Brahm sometimes. Uh, sometimes if I'm not, things aren't going too well or you know, I'm feeling a bit kind of, thing, you know, 
I don't know, not kind of restless or some defilements or whatever. I just kind of go to Ajahn Brahm, I just sit next to him. I don't need, don't need to talk, I don't need to say anything. I just sit there for a while, chill out, then I feel much better, go back to my cutie. Yeah. <laughs> kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah. And this is kind of how things are. And you can do the same thing with the suttas if you have a relationship with the Buddha. You read a sutta, it calms you down, and then, okay, now I can practice my meditation or whatever. Yeah. But the idea is finally to be independent in these teachings, not just following the Buddha around, which seems to have been this monk's problem, right? And now he is then saying, actually, I will withdraw, I will go into solitude and then practice the teachings properly. So the Buddha probably thinks that it's okay. Um, and then he says, yeah, so... This idea of being an heir to the Buddha's teachings means that obviously that you have insight into these teachings. Uh, you become independent in them. Uh, then the Buddha comes with his teaching. He had a special teaching to this monk. Yeah. And he says, well then, mendicant, uh, you should purify the starting point of skillful qualities. What is the starting point of skillful qualities? Well-purified ethics and correct view. When your ethics are well purified and your view is correct, you should develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three ways, depending on and grounded on ethics. So here you are, yeah, the foundation, the basis for Satipatthana practice, which is mindfulness of breathing, that we have been talking about so far, the foundation is these two things, uh, ethics and correct view. Uh, ethics is sila in Pali, correct view is ujju kaditi, ujju meaning straight, uh, so straight view. Uh, this is the foundation. Uh, and so what this means then uh, is that uh, if your meditation is not going as well as you are hoping it would, uh, then this is what you have to do. You have to look at your ethics, your moral conduct, uh, your kindness, uh, and you have to look at your views. Why are these things so important? Why do they matter so much? And it's pretty simple once you kind of get your head around it. Ethics is important because <coughs> <coughs> because you feel good about yourself when you are ethical. You feel a sense of goodness about yourself. You feel a sense of self-worth, self-esteem. Yeah. Not in a bragging way, but in an ordinary, peaceful way. And uh, when you feel good in the present, uh, then you tend to be mindful. Uh, if your mind has all kind of negativity in it, you don't really want to be in the present, because the present doesn't feel good. Uh, you want to make the present feel happy and good. Uh, and that comes about through ethical conduct. Uh, if you have loving kindness for the whole world, wow, the present moment is going to be Wonderful, right? You just feel this beautiful feeling for everyone. You don't judge anyone. If someone is bad, you have compassion for them rather than judge them. Yeah, whoever they might be, I don't know who, who is the kind of bogeyman in the world, right? Maybe Putin is the bogeyman in the whole world. Well, you have compassion even for him, yeah, because you realize actually he doesn't really know what's going on. And then you sit down, and of course, then the meditation is going to work. But here, so I'm going to not talk too much about ethics on this retreat, and I'll talk more about the idea of right view, but uh, remember that ethics is very profound on the Buddhist path. It's a very high bar to clear, to be really fully ethical. It is about your entire being, your entire personality, whether you're ethical or not, how you think about things, how you incline your mind, your perceptions about people and the world around you. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And there's very few people who are fully pure in ethics. In fact, the only way to be fully pure in ethics is to become a stream entry, a sota panna, someone who is on the first stage of awakening it, right? So it is very profound. So uh, please, don't take ethics lightly. In fact, ethics should always be at the back of your mind. If you really understand the importance of this, you will always have it at the back of your mind. It will be lodged in your mindfulness. Remember, mindfulness is not just about being aware, it's about knowing what you are supposed to do. It brings a kind of memory with it, right? And that memory is the memory of what you're supposed to do. The instructions from the Buddha comes with that mindfulness. 
awareness and memory, two sides of the idea of sati mindfulness. And so you lodge that in the back of your mind. So you're always, it's always there. So you want to interact with people, you kind of automatically think, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right way? Yeah, or you don't have to think that much detail, but sometimes you may feel, okay, now I'm a bit on the, some, not going quite right, yeah? So you readjust, uh, and you think, how can I look at this situation differently? Uh, how can I be kind, even though I'm not feeling like being kind right now, or, or something like that? You know what it's like, sometimes it's hard to, hard to feel like being kind at all times. Uh, and uh, so you readjust, uh, you change your perception, uh, you look at things in a different way, uh, and then things start to come together. But it's always there because you understand it's critically important for the spiritual life. In the spiritual life, it's all that really matters. You are on the path of something that really is the meaning of life. And so everything you do gets then uh, 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 gets judged, I was going to say, that's the wrong word, gets uh, kind of uh, uh, compared to this ideal of a very, very high degree of ethics. And then gradually you purify yourself and then your ethics become more profound. You start to see new, lesser defilements in the mind and then you purify those and you're gradually moving up in this way, becoming lighter and brighter person as a consequence. So um, please keep uh, these ethics in mind. This is perhaps the most important thing for the meditation to really come together. Uh, but uh, what I want to focus on now is this other term, ujjuka ditti, uh, straight view or right view or correct view, as it is called here. Uh, and uh, it may seem perhaps to you, you may wonder why correct view is so important for meditation practice. Uh, you can see why it is important at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Because at the beginning, uh, if you haven't got some kind of right view, you're not even going to be interested in the spiritual path. You're not even going to be interested in purifying the mind or doing the right things. If you think, you know, you need some kind of alignment with how things are. Yeah, kindness leads to happiness. You need that kind of alignment of your views with the teaching of the Buddha to even get started. So you can kind of see it, it is necessary at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. But uh, why is it specifically so important for meditation practice? Uh, and uh, again, it's quite simple to understand that. Uh, and uh, it is because uh, uh, to guide your mind in the right way, to take an interest in the breath, uh, you have to think that this is important. Uh, you have to think that this is where you eventually will find meaning. Uh, this is where eventually you will overcome your problems, uh, where you will go towards more joy and happiness. Uh, you have to have that kind of idea, and if you haven't got that idea, it's going to be impossible to watch your breath, because you will take an interest in all the worldly things instead. That's why there is so much thinking in meditation, because we haven't really quite got it, why the breath is so important, or why meditation practice is so important. Yeah, and um, So straight view, seeing things in the right way, enables the mind to prioritize, yeah, and then value the meditation. When you value the meditation and you don't value the world, uh, your mind is going to go towards the meditation. So it's about what we value in life. Uh, this is what really this comes down to, this idea of correct view. Uh, so it is incredibly important, right? Uh, it, it gives you the guide for everything else. Uh, that's why it is also the root of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, I should uh, Again, make this point about causality and conditionality. When we talk about the Noble Eightfold Path, we're not talking about eight random factors that happen in a random sequence. They happen in that particular sequence. Right view comes first. Right view leads to right sama sankapa, often called right intention. It could also be called right aim, right purpose, right goal. Yeah, you're heading in the right direction. That leads to the, the um, factors of morality. Then we come to the factor of right effort, which is a, pure, a deeper kind of morality. That allows meditation to happen, which is Satipatthana, which then leads to Sama Samadhi, which then goes to the ninth and tenth factor of the... It's no longer the Noble Eightfold Path, then it's not the Noble Tenfold Path, which is uh, knowledge and liberation, ultimately. So it is actually sequential. Huh? 
And uh, this is what you see in the suttas. It is actually taught in this way in a number of places by the Buddha. Everything in the suttas has a causal and conditional sequence in this way, uh, because uh, that is how the Dhamma works. Uh, nothing is random in the suttas. Uh, nothing is kind of haphazard. Uh, um, when you see the five hindrances, there's a reason why there is that sequence. Uh, when you see the five khandas, the five aggregates, the five aspects of, personal, of, of a person, uh, there is a reason why there is a sequence. Uh, nothing is random. Uh, it is very, very carefully thought out. Uh, the Buddha himself says that his Dhamma is svakato, well explained. Uh, and that means that all of these things have a, have a meaning. Uh, and uh, so when you start reading the suttas, uh, you notice these little things, right? Uh, and the sequences are always the same. The four Brahma Viharas have a certain sequence. There's a reason why they have that sequence, etc., etc., etc. So right view, therefore, is very important. It comes at the beginning of everything. Yeah. So uh, develop this, and then based on that, uh, you practice the Satipatthanas, is what he says here. Yeah. And uh, here you do it in three ways. Uh, uh, so four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three ways. So what is this? Let's just quickly go through that to kind of do the whole sutta. Uh, what for? You meditate observing an aspect of the body here, internally, here, keen, aware, and mindful, rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. Or you meditate observing an aspect of the body externally here, Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. Or you meditate observing an aspect of the body internally and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. So, um, this is a nice translation of, uh, at least the beginning there, you have the observing an aspect of the body. Yeah. Often that translation is you uh, contemplate a body in the body. I don't know if you've seen those translations. Or, or you contemplate the body as the body or something like that. And you don't really know what's going on when you hear that. Contemplate the body as the body. What on earth is that, is that supposed to mean? Uh, but whereas this is very clear, yeah? Observe an aspect of the body. Actually, you don't have any much doubt about what that means. It kind of comes out beautifully here. Yeah? And um, these are the sort of things that I would, was discussing with Bhattu Sujato at length, how to translate these kind of uh, uh, fundamental parts of the uh, suttas. Uh, and, uh, and this is, I think, exactly the right way of translating this. A body in the body means a group of phenomena within the body, which is also a group of phenomena. So you observe one aspect of the body. Yeah, we have talked about one aspect is the 31 parts, another aspect might be the four elements, another aspect is the breath. Yeah, the various kind of ways of looking at the body, called aspect or ways of looking or something like that. And internally, internally means in relation to yourself. Ajatta, literally adi atta, atta is self, adi concerning yourself. So you're observing it concerning yourself, first of all. Which is kind of interesting. You start with yourself. So if you're going to do the 31 parts of the body, it is yourself, your own body, that you look at. And then comes these important words here, which define how this meditation is supposed to happen. Yeah, mindfulness meditation. Keen, atapi. We saw this word just before. And keen is a word which straddles the ideas of effort and energy. So effort means that you apply yourself, uh, energy means that you have, that effort is already in your mind, is that energy is already exists. Uh, you don't really have to apply yourself very much because the energy is there. And Atapi has a little bit of uh, both of those words uh, in it. Uh, initially, as you do your meditation, you have to apply yourself a little bit, uh, and after a while the energy arises, uh, and it's a natural application of the mind that just happens by itself. Atapi. Aware, sampajano. You have come across this word before. Did we? I can't remember now. I, I have certainly come across it before, but I, I get so mixed up with where I've said what that I kind of. Anyway, sampajano is the idea sometimes called clear comprehension or full awareness. 
Panta Sujato here translates it as a situational awareness. Uh, you have a, another awareness that is uh, particularly applicable to the situation that you are in. Yeah, and uh, that is the usual way of understanding this because uh, it happens before uh, Sampajano is used in different contexts. Uh, one of the contexts is before you get to meditation, yeah? how you apply yourself in daily life, for example, to ensure that your mind remains reasonably pure. But here Sampajano is in the uh, context of meditation, so slightly different meaning, uh, and it basically means that you know the purpose and suitability of what you're doing here. Uh, similar to the idea of the memory aspect of sati. Yeah, you know, you are aware, you monitor your practice, uh, and you know whether you are practicing the breath or not, or whether you are losing the plot entirely, and you're kind of all over the place, or you know, <laughs> you have some idea what's going on there. Yeah, this is idea of sampajano here. Yeah. You are directing your mind in the right way. You can tell whether you're progressing properly, you can tell whether you are regressing, or, or what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, and then you are mindful, yeah, and this is Satima, again this idea that you have to be mindful, this is part of the practice, you have to establish this first, uh, so you bring the mindfulness into the practice. And then you have the last part here, you are rid of covetousness and bitterness for the world. Uh, all right, so uh, what <laughs> What exactly does this mean? Basically what it means is that you are rid of desire and aversion for the world. Uh, to me that is an easy way of thinking about this. Uh, um, bitterness to me is way too specific in, in this context. Uh, the Pali word is do manasa. Do manasa literally means a bad mind. Do manasa. Manas is mind. Do is bad or do bad. Uh, so it means like a bad mind. Uh, and uh, the world here uh, is a reference to the five senses. Yeah? The, the, it's often talked about as the world, because to most of us, the world is the five senses, right? This is what we know about the world around us. Uh, that is what we are immersed in at all times, the five senses. Uh, so this is really the world for most people. Uh, uh, that world can be expanded if you get into meditation, but that is kind of the root idea of the world, the five senses. Uh, so you have desire and aversion for the world of the five senses. Uh, Sometimes you like the things you see in that world, uh, you get desire. Sometimes you, oh, yuck, uh, you have aversion for that world. Uh. Yeah, uh, so like and dislike is another way of thinking about it. Pleasure and displeasure. Uh, I think bitterness is too specific. I don't know why he has chosen that word. Uh, I should write to him and tell him off, uh, because uh, he never listens to me anyway. So I'm not sure why I do this, but uh, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so this is really what it means. Yeah, in the world of the five senses, we have a tendency either to like things or don't like things. Uh, there are people we are attracted to, and there are people we don't really want to have to deal with. Uh, there are sights we enjoy, and there are sights we actually are really kind of slightly repulsive. Uh, and so is that whole world. Uh, so it is a, kind of the two aspects of craving: the uh, uh, the uh, liking of craving and the rejection part of craving. Yeah. They both uh, come into, for, uh, into the fore here. Yeah. And so you can see here, you are rid of those things, right? You have already abandoned those things. Uh, and why is that? Because that abandoning happen, happens at the previous stage, which is right effort. Uh, we're here looking at right mindfulness, which is the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. The factor before that is right effort. That is where this abandoning happens. And so, right effort is really the effort to keep your mind pure. You have to avoid excessive aversion. Aversion is actually okay. Ill will is the problem. But aversion has a tendency to move into ill will. And that is the, really the issue here. So you keep your mind reasonably pure, and then when you come to Satipatthana practice, because you have given up the coarser aspects of desire and ill will, you are able to be present. Strong desire, strong ill will makes your mind go all over the place. Once these things are abandoned, you have the ability to be mindful. And this is why this is mentioned here as part of this. So this is really what this is about, yeah? abandoning the <coughs> desires and aversion for the, for the world. 
aversion is the word aversion is kind of interesting because it is used slightly differently by people these days. So sometimes people use the word aversion almost as synonymous with ill will. But uh, if you look it up in a proper dictionary, huh, you will see that that is not really how it is defined usually. Huh? Uh, maybe that definition will change because when people change the usage, then the definition changes by default. Uh, but uh, traditionally and usually, aversion just means that you are, it's more like, oh, no, I can't deal with it. Uh, but there's no ill will there, it's just a rejection of something mentally. Huh? So, uh, yeah, so then you do this kind of practice, you do it internally, huh? you do it externally, huh? and externally means in relation to the bodies of other people. So, if you do the 31 parts of the body, or the four elements, you do it towards your own body, and then you do it towards other people's body. Huh? Yeah, the breath doesn't work so well here because you, other people's breath is hard to contemplate, huh? but uh, 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 certainly with the 31 parts of the body, this works really well. Uh, and then the last one here is both internally and externally, both, both in relationship to yourself uh, and in relationship to others. Uh, and this is where you have this kind of universal insight, uh, yeah, where uh, you understand all the bodies have this nature. Uh, there is no perfect body anywhere. Uh, everyone has the same eye, eye is uh, afflicted by this problem. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of where you universalize this whole thing here. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of let's carry on. I don't want to spend too much time on this. And you meditate observing an aspect of feelings, yeah? An aspect of feelings, yeah? Again, internally in regard to yourself, externally for others, both internally and externally, keen, aware, and mindful. Um, a rid of desire and aversion for the world of the five senses. So feelings internally, first of all, you observe directly your own feelings. And externally means that you are aware that other people will be feeling the same thing. And then you can make the universal inference that everyone feels like this. The idea by doing this kind of universal understanding is to really to understand that there is no escape from these things, right? It, it doesn't matter if you get reborn like that, or you live your life in this way, or you get reborn as a deva even, that regardless of what you do, these things are universal aspects of existence. Even not just, not limited to human beings, but universal aspects of existence. And this is kind of this idea of making it universal in this way, internal and external, everywhere. There is no escape. There is no kind of corner of samsara where this will be fine and you don't have to worry about anything and she'll be right. That's an Australian expression. I'm just teaching a bit of Australian idiom while I'm here. <laughs> she'll be right means kind of no worries. Yeah, that, <laughs> That's how things are interesting too. Uh, go to Australia and learn some of these uh, idioms. Every country has their own way of speaking. Uh, anyway, that's uh, beside the point. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you universally right. There is no place uh, outside of this conditionality here. And then the same thing with the other, the other things here. You meditate observing an aspect of the mind, uh, internally, externally, internally and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world of the five senses. You observe, meditate observing an aspect of principles. This is the causality principles. Internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world of the five senses. When you develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in these three ways, Depending on and grounded on ethics, you can expect growth, not decline in skillful qualities, whether by day or by night. Yeah, that is the promise of the Buddha. You can expect growth in good qualities. Skillful here is kusala, sometimes translated as wholesome, here translated as skillful. They are both wholesome and skillful. They're wholesome in the sense that they are healthy, good qualities that make you feel good, make you feel happy. And they are skillful in the sense that they promote awakening and lead you in the right direction. So kusala is this beautiful word and has a number of kind of facets to it. So 
that's what you have to do now. Yeah, and the growth will be yours. This is the real growth. Uh, forget about all other kinds of growth. Uh, this is the only growth that matters. Uh, so make sure you choose your right kind of growth. Uh, if you choose the right wrong kind of growth, uh, it will not work. Yeah. So everything has to be chosen carefully, yeah, including growth. Uh, so uh, then comes the very last part of this sutta. Yeah, this is kind of where it gets inspiring, because at the bottom of the sutta always comes what happens as a consequence. And uh, it says, and then that mendicant approved and agreed with what the Buddha had said. He got up from his seat, bowed and respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right before leaving him. So you approve of the teaching, yeah, not just approve, but you are inspired by them. The, the Pali words here are actually much stronger than what he says. Uh, Abhinandati, I think, is the Pali word here. Uh, I should really have the Pali available to me so I can check and I'll tell you some dodgy stuff. Uh, ah, there is no... Okay, anyway, so it's Abhinandati, usually, I think, is the Pali word. Uh, and what that means is like rejoicing in, being glad in something, yeah? being inspired about something, yeah? being uplifted. Uh, and this is kind of the point. When you do hear a good teaching, the idea is to be uplifted by these teachings. Uh, because when you are uplifted, when you are inspired, that is what motivates you to act. Right? Inspiration in all walks of life motivates us to act. Uh, that's why you have these motivational speakers. <laughs> Not, not that I recommend listening to too many of those, but you have those motivational speakers uh, and they kind of inspire you to act, right? Uh, and the Buddha is the ultimate motivational speaker. Uh, we should get him on that circuit, uh, speaker circuit, and get him kind of... Uh, I don't know how we would do that, but that would maybe be more useful for people rather than some of all these other motivational speakers. Uh, but anyway, it's, a, it's very motivational, in a, but in a very different sense. Uh, a lot of these people who are motivational speakers in the world, they kind of fire you up in a restless, a very worldly kind of way, and they give rise to desires, and it is those desires that make you act. Whereas the Buddha makes you act in a different way. It is not really desire or craving that makes you act, but insight, understanding, inspiration, that these are really important and powerful things. The different kind of motivational speaker the Buddha. But this is what happens when you hear these teachings. And this is one of the very important reasons why we should come back to these teachings again and again, to allow them to inspire us. Don't take the word of the Buddha as merely being information. It is much more than information. Information is part of it, especially when you start out as a Buddhist. You want to have information so you know what's going on. But a more important thing in the long run is the inspiration it kind of gives you. You really want to practice these teachings, right? You think, wow, this is profound, this is beautiful, this is really what life is about. And then you set out to do these things. You actually are kind. Not only are you kind, but you improve in your kindness. You change your perceptions about people, and you really do something with this. And this is what happens, presumably, to this particular monk. Yeah, he's really inspired, because now what happens next is exactly what should happen. Then that mendicant, living alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen, and resolute, soon realized the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. He lived, having achieved with his own insight the goal for which gentlemen rightly go forth from the lay life to homelessness. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so here he does exactly what he has said that he was supposed to do. He goes into seclusion, into an empty hut, the foot of a tree, and like we saw before, or into a wilderness, right? We saw this thing before. And he realizes the supreme end of the spiritual path. Uh, the, um, uh, for in this very life, and of course that is a very important thing in Buddhism, it is in this very life. You don't wait till after you die or anything like that. Uh, yeah, and then you achieve with his own insight, and that's kind of the critical thing, it is your own insight. Now you know what is going on. Uh, uh, you, the goal for which gentlemen and gentle women, I suppose, uh, gentle people, rightly go forth from lay life into homelessness. Uh, 
So uh, the idea of a gentleman, I think, Bhattasurada is the only person who translates this word as a gentleman. The Pali word is Kula, Buddha. And Kula is uh, like a clan, a family. Uh, and Buddha is like a child or a family or someone who belongs to that family. Uh, and uh, this was like the, uh, the units in, in which, into which uh, ancient India was divided yeah, into families. Uh, and families were just like in the West, they used to be in the old days, the families were large. Yeah? There were all the generations and all the aunties and uncles and everyone living under one roof. Uh, and then the servants and the workers, and sometimes they were slaves as well. All the slaves in India were quite different from the slaves that uh, existed in places like uh, ancient Greece. Uh, still, yeah, all these people living together. Uh, the Kulaputta were the heads of these families, yeah? so they kind of ran the business of the family, which may have been farming or something like that. So they were like the, these were like the units uh, upon which this whole Indian society was um, established or formed based on these units. And so they would, in a sense, have been like the, almost like the establishment, maybe not establishment is too strong a word, it makes it too lofty, yeah? but they were like the the people who had assets, who owned something, yeah, who, who had a, a reason for a, a kind of living ordinary life because they had the sufficient wealth and these kind of things. So, so they were like the upstanding people in that society. Yeah? They were a gentle, what might be called a gentleman or gentlewoman in, a, in kind of English. Uh, so that translation is actually quite nice. Uh, yeah? They were the good people of that society. Yeah? And of course the point of that kind of expression uh, is to say that uh, you don't practice Buddhism just because you are oppressed. If you are a slave, of course, if you are a slave, you become a monk straight away, so you get out of slavery. Yeah, of course, yeah, so please become a monk. Yeah. And, and, but if you are, you know, a gentleman and you kind of, you are well situated in society and things are going well for you, have enough wealth, no, no need to become a monk, yeah, because things are going well for you already. But of course, that's completely missing the point. But it's taking a very superficial idea of what Buddhism is about. Buddhism is for everyone. If you are on top of the entire world, still Buddhism is for you. Because actually it doesn't make all that much difference whether you are wealthy or not, whether you are famous or not, whether you are highly esteemed or not. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, what is the difference whether you are, whether you have a kind of fancy car or an ordinary car? Does it really make you all that much happy? No, is the answer. It just makes almost exactly no difference at all. You enjoy that fancy car for a week or two, and then it becomes just like an ordinary car afterwards. And so the point is that the Dhamma is way above any of these things, way above any worldly values or worldly things. Uh, even the gods in the heavenly realms who are supremely more happy uh, than human beings, uh, they too uh, become Buddhists, they too practice the path, uh, they too become stream enterers because they realize actually God life is pretty miserable. Uh, yeah, God life, who wants to be a god, right? Yeah, oh, <laughs> yucky. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of interesting, you read the suttas uh, and you see what God life is, about, is, is like, actually it's not all that interesting, yeah? they, have, they are a bit like glorified human beings, yeah? and sometimes they have wars, okay the wars are a bit less, uh, a bit less kind of damaging than in the human realm, yeah, they never die and that kind of stuff, so it's not, kind of not so bad. Uh, but they have problems with their kids, their children, right? They have kind of... Uh, so actually it is not really all that interesting, yeah? it's kind of fascinating to see that in the suttas. Uh, so, um, yeah, he practices in the right way. He does as the Buddha has said. And he practices in solitude and he becomes an arahant. And uh, you will notice the word soon there. Yeah. So what does that mean, soon? Does that mean that you can expect to become an arahant on this retreat? The answer is no, you cannot expect that. Unless you are doing incredibly well already. If you are already attaining the jhanas, one, two, three, four, and whatever, then maybe you can become an arahant on this retreat. Uh, but um, the chances are pretty small. I have to disappoint you on that one. Uh, I don't know if you expected to come here. Yeah? Sometimes uh, Ajahn Brahm, he has these titles for his retreat, and one of his famous titles was Nibbana or Bust. Yeah? <laughs> Usually it means a bust, right? So, <laughs> so uh, 
So soon here has this kind of interesting idea when you read the sutras. You realize soon means like thirty years. Yeah, that's soon. So <laughs> yeah, that's fast, right? And, and if you think about things in a kind of kind of cosmic Buddhist perspective in terms of rebirth and all that, thirty years is actually really really quickly. Yeah, yeah it doesn't really get much more. Things don't get much more quick than that according in the sutras. Uh, so soon is uh, soon has a different feeling in the uh, suttas than elsewhere. Again, the Buddha is a bit understated, right? Uh, oh yeah, it's or is that understated or is it overstated? I'm not sure now. I'm getting confused. Uh, anyway, it is. Um, this is how this works. Uh. So uh, for the rest of this, uh, most of this retreat, uh, I'm going to focus on the idea of right view because it is so incredibly important. Uh, and I think it is something that is generally underemphasized in Buddhism, not really understood properly enough. So I want to really focus on the idea of right view. And because right view is so important, and because we are born into this world with wrong view, it means that we have to develop the right view to kind of get our minds aligned in the right direction in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, so a lot of the practice in Buddhism is actually learning to develop our perceptions, uh, learning to see things in a new way, uh, to align ourselves with these teachings. Uh, and this is such an important part of this. Uh, and if you have any doubts about what you should be doing in your Buddhist practice, uh, a lot of your Buddhist practice can be just contemplating these teachings, uh, contemplating aspects of your life, and seeing if you can align yourself more with uh, uh, how these teachings work. Yeah. And I will show you some ways of doing precisely that uh, as we go through the next sutta. Uh, the next sutta is uh, a very, very, very interesting sutta. I would really recommend you to read it uh, if you can. Uh, sorry, I haven't finished the sutta yet. Uh, I said, really, there's one more paragraph. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so I've got one minute to finish the last paragraph. So let me focus on that instead of moving on to the next sutta. So this is what happens when you become an arahant. Yeah, he understood. Rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. And that mendicant became one of the perfected ones, one of the arahants. Beautiful. And of course, what is so interesting here is that you will notice that what it means to be an arahant, if you look at this as the content of the knowledge of arahantship, of awakening, it is all about the ending of rebirth. Rebirth is ended. There is no return to any state of existence, right? Both about rebirth. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. That doesn't really add very much. You just know that you have completed things. But the main insight is that you know that rebirth has been ended. That is what the spiritual life is about, uh, because that is really the problem at hand. Uh, so, uh, very kind of important. I'm glad I, I, I saw that paragraph just in the nick of time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and it's uh, so a very important part. This is what you know as an Arahant. And uh, you may wonder how you can know that. Uh, but the reason why you know that is because you understand the causal relationship between craving and rebirth. And because craving is gone, rebirth becomes impossible. So I will stop there and I will, uh, there will be some more interviews shortly. So for those of you who are on the interview list, please uh, come uh, and I'll see you over there. And if you don't want to say anything of those interviews, please just sit there and relax and not need to say anything. And then uh, please have a nice lunch again. And we'll see you back here again here. When Upeka, are you going to continue? Yeah, okay. When Upeka will continue with her guided meditations at 2 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, that's it for 2.30. Sorry, 2.30.